We have a special guest. I'm not buying into the love. This is not a special guest that came from like Queens and rode the train. This is a special guest that came all the way from the UK. Okay, that's a long way. Those of you that have never seen a map, there's an ocean in between us and them. We call it the ocean, they call it the pond. Across the pond. So now, all the way from the UK, are you ready for our special guest? Mark Grist is a spoken word artist and English teacher based in the UK. He became Poet Laureate of Peterborough in 2008 and Chief Bard of the Fens in 2009. He will translate that into English US when he gets up here. That's English UK. There's a difference. As well as becoming the Edinburgh Fringes Slam Champion in 2010. He's been on three national tours and has performed in the House of the Commons. He will again educate you as to what that means for those of you that don't know anything about the UK. You don't need to read a book. He's been on, oh, I'm sorry. He is long, his hour-long spoken word show, Dead Poets, explores the relationship between hip-hop and poetry and has been touring nationally for the past two years. His new spoken word show, Shetland Boy, de details life growing up on the most northern island in the UK. Put your hands together for a man that has come a long distance to be with us tonight. It is Mark Chris Jones Love. Hi, hi. Uh, oh, well, thank you. Uh, this, is, this is quite exciting. Um, I came down on Tuesday and I read uh, a piece then, and I gave the audience a choice between love and hate, um, and they overwhelmingly went for hate. Uh, so I'm hoping we're okay with a more loving piece to start out now. Uh, this is a piece I wrote. Uh, anyone here ever been to the UK? Yeah. Okay, a few people. Okay, well, if you haven't, this is your chance to get an idea about what growing up in the UK is like, because this is a true story uh, about the first time that I ever fell in love uh, when I was 10 years old. Uh, and her name, she was much prettier than her name suggests, because her name was um, Beth Builder. Uh, <laughs> and it goes um, exactly like this. Um, when I was ten years old, I knew that her name was alliterative. But that's not why she'd give me thrills running past the classroom window sill. A short skirt, a shrill shriek, whenever she ran home from school, see... Beth Builder was gorgeous, in a way you just couldn't score it. She was beauty in the way that Tony Hart would draw it, and the primary school rumour mill was green and in full grind because Beth Builder had said she fancied me. <laughs> she told Liz Windell behind the Cadbury's factory it was only a matter of time until she would maybe even talk to me. I blushed at her company for weeks. And as this recounted Beth's speech of fancy, I felt resplendent, my cheeks aflame. I was reeling during break time, thinking, oh, Beth Builder feels the same. And when I went home that night to play my computer games, she was every princess I did rescue. I was every hero she did tame. But over the following days, I began to grow dismayed. See, Beth didn't come and talk to me. She stayed with her mates. She played by the gates, and when I waved, she... Laughed, causing my heart to deflate, and as my mates would push me over with an impending sense of dread, her tender voice of glass cried out, Piss off, cabbage heads! <laughs> See, because back then my hair was pretty messy and unruly, and during primary school she didn't want to know me because I had all these curls. So that world of pride that Liz's lies and unfold just blew up inside. And I began to realise that love was more complicated than I'd been led to understand. What I needed was a plan. So I devised it. Using my mother as a template for women across the land, if I was to impress Beth, I had to dress really smart, be polite, and work really hard, show the depth of knowledge I didn't command. But I was so absorbed in this master plan that I failed to see or understand Beth wasn't that interested in that English and maths work that my mother thought was so grand. See, Beth Builder's main hobby was preserving dolls' dresses in little plastic bags 
Well, I stuck around after school discussing Chess Club and Nintendo Max, and the fact that Miss Howe's face sagged with her bed handed in her work, it just didn't register. I wanted so badly to impress her. That's the stupor I was in, that I just worked like a demon. I read for the blue, green, red, and purple section until I was the first kid allowed to read anything in my school, and I worked, and I worked, and I worked. While Beth just played, laughed, jerked outside, doing handstands, showing other boys her frilly knickers, and... <laughs> All I was getting for my efforts was a bunch of smiley stickers. And <laughs> I figured, no, this isn't good enough. One week after coming top with some tests, I thought it'd be best to phone Beth Builder and ask her out. So I did. The receiver slipping in my palm. When Beth picked up, I said, hello. And I hope sounded calm. She said, who's that? I said, um, it's Mark. She said, what, cabbage head? Here I attempted... A feeble laugh, she said, wait there, and left. And I did wait for what seemed like ages, until another voice came back, like this little gurgling whisper. And I realised that Beth had put me on the phone to her little baby sister, and I said, hello. It was just this pause, this hesitation, then just this babyish declaration. She taught her baby sister to say it. I don't know what it was, but it had some kind of scalpel effect on me. I yelped, I dropped the phone to Beth's laughter, ran, tripped on the directory. Apparently it was the first time that baby had said two words consecutively, but I didn't care. I offered her my heart, and she'd taken all that I was, and she'd ripped it apart, and I promised myself I'd forever walk the path that had no girls, no handstands, no love or whatever, forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. But I got over it. And now I'm a teacher, and I'm a writer, and I'm happy with both. And I figured I'd done pretty well with the scope of ability at my control, but even so, something within me swells at the thought of Beth Builder. And I figured maybe it'd be calmer if she had a job she kind of hated in a shop, like she cleaned the chicken ovens at Tesco or mop people sick up. And I, I bumped into her brother Tom and I asked what she's now up to. It, it turns out she's now an image consultant in London, and she's very successful. And as much as I hate it, I'm kind of impressed. Well, I figured for the girl she was at school, that profession seems great. And maybe it's not the moments you love, but more the moments you hate that make you who you are. Like not the time you got picked for the team, but more the time you didn't measure up by far. And I think that's why Beth Builder's name holds relevance. When I look back and see pictures of the boy who hadn't met yet, who didn't know what he'd grow up to be. Because I think the first stab at image consultancy my hair gave to Beth Builder. <laughs> and a bit of the man I am today, she definitely gave to me. Cool. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> cool, thank you. Right. Um, who would like to see a British guy rap? <laughs> yeah. Okay, this has been the project. I basically, for six months, I became... Uh, I stopped being a, a poet for this uh, challenge. I decided to try and become a rapper. Um, a rapper swapped with me. I have these CDs that we're selling for like five dollars just to give them the last ones. Um, this has got these tracks that are basically like basically trying to see if an English teacher and a poet can become a rapper. We have grime uh, battle rap in the UK, and I decided to enter a grime battle rap tournament. It's essentially, if you've seen Eminem's Eight Mile, it's like that, but with people threatening to throw tea on each other. Like that's kind of <laughs> that's essentially it. Um, so I had to turn up in nightclubs at like one in the morning wearing a suit and like hurl abuse at guys uh, and get them hurling abuse back. My, my rap name was the Count of Monte Cristo. Uh, <laughs> incidentally, Monte Cristo is my uh, Twitter feed. And basically, I had to announce myself as a serious contender in this grind battle. And I realised that a lot of grind battle rap is about saying I'm really tough, I'm really dangerous, and I'm really fucking good at rapping. Um, and I'm not tough, I'm not dangerous, and I can't rap. So. I spoke to a few rappers and they said the, the most important thing is being true to yourself uh, within, within, within hip hop and so I realised I'm not tough, I'm not dangerous, but I am really tough and I am really dangerous when it comes to playing board games. So <laughs> genuinely at one o'clock in the morning in, in a London nightclub I turned up in a seat and someone shouted out, who wants to hear some poetry? And one girl went, yeah, and that was it. Uh, and they pushed me onto a mic and I performed this. If I don't even know if you'll have the same board games as we have in the UK, but the competition is if you can count how many are featured. Uh, and it goes like this. 
Because you boys in the hood think you're up to no good, but your skills are the dice are lame. I'll top Trump, you weak punks, you'll get trashed in Kaplunk. Yeah, I'm really, 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 really good at board games. I'm like an MB innovation, rolling dice and dishing cards without any reservation. When it comes to risk, I tell you this, I am the global nation. Coming at your boot camp, shaka like a blue cannon infestation. A stone age deforestation, I give mousetrap demonstrations. And every game of operation is like a military... Operation. You'll soon make the observation nothing trivial in my pursuit. I'm cracking skulls every evening when I'm out of my suit, playing the old Tom Pirates Cove, stealing your booty. I did pretty well on atmosphere, though that DVD was spooky. I don't give a toss about a loss against you in Call of Duty, because I disemboweled you. In guess who? <laughs> Well, I was Sue, and you were James. That's because I'm really, 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 really good at board games. If it's punch out, I'll split your lip. If it's poker, I'll take each chip. Buckaroo, I'll make you make him kick. The lightning quick, you'll find I've sucked your battleship. I fry bacon when I play past the picks till you wee, wee, wee all the way home. And my meatball, I leap though in every game of car, because I know I'm in the zone in Monopoly. Just no stopping me. Open up the pieces with that little silver doggy. Snap them in the oranges. It's like a rubbish property. I'm made for again. Oh, what will you offer me? Blood. Because <laughs> you boys think you're tight, you think you're up for a fight, but you clearly are prepared for the pain. I'll dice you all up, as long as it isn't a school night. Yeah, I'm really, 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 really good at board games. I'm better than good. I'm very good. Trained well since the cradle to dominate any kitchen table. In settlers of Catan, I get more all than casual grey skull. When you get the sheep, which are cheap, and your bar is pretty painful. You want to roleplay well, I dabble, but I'd rather take you out in a game of Scrabble. Waiting triple word scores that they were lethal short swords. Spitting far onto the boards as looking places you reward because the boys in the hood think they're up to no good. But heroes live forever. No one's going to remember any of your names. And I'm probably going to get the crap kicked out of me tonight, but I'm still really, really, really fucking good at board games. Cool, thank you very much. Yeah. Cool, uh, can you keep on moving through? Got two more. Um, uh, yeah, I am the chief bard of the Fens. It's probably the most uncool title in the world to have. Basically, the Fens is a massive empty space uh, in the UK. Huge space of kind of like just, just, just grass and trees and nothing else. Like, you totally flat. I don't know if you, you can learn something like that, but there's no hills. Like, as far as the eye can see. And they wanted someone to write about the local area. And the competition was to see who could stand up and read an original piece about the Fens. I decided to write what is supposed to be one of the hardest forms of poetry, and it's probably a true example uh, of why I shouldn't be allowed to meet people and hang out with people in general. Um, basically, this form of poetry is called a univocalism. I don't know if anyone's heard of a univocalism before. It's a French form of poetry where you are only allowed to use one vowel. Genuinely, uh, that's it. You're allowed to use one lap vowel and that's it. Um, so, this is about the Fens. Incidentally, it's in E. Uh, and the best thing about it is it's already finished because the end you can use. Um, so, once I start, I'm not allowed to use any vowel other than E. Hopefully, it will make sense. My references are British references. I've got one American one in there. See if you can spot it that I've chucked in. It goes uh, like this. Meet Beth, 23, excellent dresser, she reeks style. Weekends, Beth gets cheeky, she necks beer recklessly, she never expected the sheer hell reserved when she entered the fence. 10.20, Beth left Eden, sped her VW Beetle West, swerved, screeched her steed, beep, beeped the steer wheel. Her geezer, Stephen, peers meekly. He resembles Lenny Henry, we'll go with. Um, except he's weedy. Sheep pressed between Spencer's vest, Beth yells, we'll see the fens, then get wet. Stephen remembers the decree. He he enters the beetle, delves gently, seeks the belt. Beth revs, they cheer, then speed freely. When they enter the fence, green, fresh smells meet Beth's senses. Creeks, trees, weeds, levees greet them sweetly. Speechless they creep, the elements stem themselves, bend themselves everywhere they step, except every step gets deeper, denser, 
The empty scenery, greenery seems endless. Stephen feels creeped. He pretends the scheme's serene, yet secretly every tree leers. Endless, eyeless, the enemy peers. Stephen's nerves melt, jelly blend. Then, when the deep sky speckles, Beth preps her reedy bed. Stephen shelters level, edgy sleeve tenderly pets Beth's flesh. Well, Beth's eyes needle when she sees the tent he's erected. <laughs> Breathing needs rejected, Stephen sleeps neglected. Then, sleep spent, they peel themselves free. They creep, the trees bleed, scenery ferments. Beth tells herself they'll never flee the fens, except ten weeks spent, Beth emerges, enters the next settlement. She teeters, her energy levels receded, dress shredded, feet wet, perm demented, except she's free. Yet where's Stephen? Well, let's expel the mystery. Heed Beth's well-fed belches. Her greedy belly swelled. She fended when needs expected. When she felt empty, her Stephen merely resembled beefy, yet nerdy. On tray. The end. Thank you. <laughs> Last piece. Quite a short one. Thank you so much for having me down here. Um, this is uh, dedicated to Anne, who's been fantastic and has had uh, my, my girlfriend Lisa and I staying over at hers the last couple of days. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, if you're over over in the UK, oh, well, hit me up. I'm on Monty Gristow, is my uh, Twitter name. Let me know. If you're over in the UK, I run some poetry over there. It'd be cool to have you guys uh, over to perform. Um, this last piece I was called a feminist anthem by the Scotsman newspaper, which is very nice. I basically wrote it because I was out with a bunch of rugby players, and they're nice guys, and the, but they were saying a lot of stuff about women that I didn't really agree with. Uh, and like any good poet, I kind of went, yeah, absolutely, uh, and then went home and wrote a really witty response. Um, and, and they're definitely not here, so I can definitely perform it. Um, uh, so it goes like this. And thank you all for listening. Um, so. What do you go for in a girl? He crows, lifting the lager to his lips. He gestures where his mate sits, then downs his glass. He prefers tits. <laughs> I prefer ass. What do you go for in a girl? Well, I feel quite uncomfortable. The air left the room a long time ago. All eyes are on me, if you must know. I like a girl who reads. <laughs> yeah, reads. I I'm not trying to call you a chauvinist, because I know that you're not alone in this, but I like a girl who reads, who needs the written word, and who uses the added vocabulary she gleans from novels and poetry to hold lively conversation in a range of social situations. I like a girl who reads, whose heart bleeds at the words of Graham Greene. Or even People magazine. Red Megrams, they are coming for that. Um, she'll tie back her hair while she's reading Jane Eyre, and she goes cover to cover with each Waterstones three for two of her. But I want a girl who doesn't stop there. I want a girl who reads, who feeds her addiction for fiction with an unusual with unusual poems and plays that she hunts out in crooked bookshops for days and days and days. She'll sit addicted at breakfast, soaking up the back of the cornflakes box, and the info she gets from what she reads makes her a total fox, because she's interesting, and she's unique, and her theories make me go weak at the knees. I want a girl who reads. A girl whose eyes will analyse the menu over dinner, will use what she learns to kick my ass in arguments so she always ends the winner, but she'd still be sweet, and she'd still be flirty, because she loves the classics, and they're pretty dirty. <laughs> And that means late at night she'll always have me in a stupor as we reenact the raunchy bits from the works of Jimmy Cooper. <laughs> some guys prefer asses, some prefer tits. And I'm not saying that I don't like those bits. But what's more important, what supersedes, is a girl with passion, wit, and dreams. So I like a girl who reads. <laughs> Clap it up one more time for Mark Grist all the way from